Stephanie Galuni. I thank you all for being here and providing coverage for this important issue. In 2018, the Massachusetts State Legislature passed and Governor Baker signed a landmark criminal justice reform package. Contained within the law were many positive and constructive, constructive reforms in policy changes, including greater accessibility for record expungement and sealing, more humane solitary confinement conditions, stronger opiate trafficking conditions or penalties, pardon me, the elimination of mandatory minimum sentences for many low-level drug offenses, and the increase of the minimum age of criminal responsibility from age seven to age 12. Also, however, contained in the 2018 criminal justice reform law was the establishment of medical parole here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which allows for the release of a prisoner due to terminal illness or permanent incapacitation. That's the language of the statute. This statute directs in the case of inmates in state prison that this decision is made unilaterally by the commissioner of the Department of Corrections. This places the commissioner in the position to single-handedly void a sentence that was litigated and eventually rendered by a superior court judge. In most cases, after years of litigation, a dissection of the evidence, and a plea or a jury's conviction. This enormous responsibility can be carried out in mere days and many times without even a hearing on the facts of the incapacity or illness that is argued. This law has come to apply to all sentenced inmates, including those serving life sentences for first degree murder convictions. The law does not apparently exclude or otherwise distinguish these inmates whose sentences represent the most serious punishment our laws allow, which explicitly preclude the possibility of parole. There is no doubt that those convicted of first degree murder have committed a most egregious act in the taking of another, another person's life with a specific intent to do so. Under the laws of the Commonwealth, first degree murder and only this charge directs that these individuals are sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Although it may first appear that justice is rendered through the court system in cases ending with a conviction, families soon come to realize that the fight does not end there and that justice is not indelible. Soon thereafter, seemingly endless appeals and motions come like the seasons year after year. Their fight for justice never ends and the pain never subsides. Since these changes to the state's medical parole law went into effect, the Hamden District Attorney's Office has been notified by the Massachusetts Department of Corrections of 45 petitions for medical parole. Of those 45 petitions, nearly half, 21 of those petitions, have been made by inmates convicted of murder. Some of the reasons cited in their petitions for this early release purportedly to establish a quote, permanent incapacitation as the statute directs, have included hypertension, the need for a wheelchair, prediabetes, insomnia, obesity, COVID-19, and back pain. Members of my office often serve as the voice for victims and their families who don't have an opportunity to speak for themselves. However, today, we have two people and family members who can speak for their lost loved ones and about how this process has affected them and their families. In January of 1982, Anthony Olszewski murdered 19-year-old Joanne Welch. Olszewski committed the crime in a particularly heinous fashion, later telling friends that, quote, she just wouldn't die. Joanne was a fighter and managed to stay alive through this brutal assault, only succumbing after Olszewski left her in a remote location in the middle of winter where she died of exposure. Olszewski was convicted of first degree murder, which was later overturned by the SJC. His case was retried and he was convicted a second time of murder in the first degree. To this day, 40 years later, he continues to contrive post-conviction motions and appeals on both the state and federal levels. 
The Welch family has endured 40 years of Olszewski's virtual, virtually relentless attempts to undo justice. With regard to medical parole, Olszewski has filed two medical parole petitions in 2020 and 2021. Fortunately, both of those were denied. John Stowe brutally stabbed and killed John Regan in 1995. He was tried and convicted in 1997 and has since filed numerous post-conviction appeals, leading to dozens of motions and hearings. Through these court events over the past 25 years, his family has had to constantly relive the tragic killing of their loved one every time that they are notified of another motion being filed or hearing being held. Stote has filed four petitions pursuant to the medical parole statute, specifically three medical parole petitions, 2020 and 2021. Uh, he also filed one petition to the Suffolk Superior Court in 2020. He was released now twice. His first release was revoked by the parole board since the basis of his first release was that he was terminally ill with COVID. He survived that period of time and lived outside of incarceration until such time the parole board finally stepped in and reincarcerated him. He filed another petition to the commissioner of DOC under the medical parole statute that was denied and then appealed effectively to the Suffolk Superior Court in Boston, where a judge essentially directed the commissioner to reconsider her, her, her decision that he found arbitrary and capricious and essentially forced her hand to release him again. Mr. Stode has been out for a lengthy period of time uh, under that release, effectively by the Suffolk Superior Court and ultimately by the commissioner of the Department of Corrections. In 2004, Joanne Sleech Brodeur stabbed her husband, Joseph Brodeur, 34 times, fatally wounding him. She was convicted of first degree murder, which was then overturned on appeal. She eventually pled guilty to second degree murder and admitted to killing her husband. Ms. Sleech Brodeur has filed three medical parole petitions, two in 2020 and one in 2021. Fortunately, all of those have been denied. At this point, I invite uh, Jim Welch to speak about his family's experiences with medical parole. Well, good morning and, and thank you to uh, District Attorney Galuni. Um, his uh, willingness to stand up for victims and victims' families uh, certainly does not go unnoticed here, uh, obviously in Western Massachusetts, but really across the state. Um, it's not always a, a popular stance uh, in today's climate uh, to support and stand up for victims, um, but you do that um, constantly. And I want to thank you on behalf of our family. Um, today I'm joined by uh, my cousin uh, Patty, uh, my cousin Paula, her husband Dan, and my brother John. Um, I'm the cousin of Joanne Welch. I was six years old when uh, the murder happened. and just speak a little bit about, you know, as the DA had mentioned, just the year after year after year, um, you know, attempts to appeal, attempts to do whatever he can to get out of jail. Do say and attempt anything to get out of jail. And the latest, unfortunately, is his attempt to use COVID-19 as a medical reason to be released on medical parole. Now the medical parole law, as the DA had mentioned, was a well-intentioned law. If someone is at the end of their life, if they're terminal, if they are, a doctor determines them that they have no, they do not have long to live, medical parole would then step in. Medical parole is not supposed to be used for people to take advantage of a loophole and to apply uh, to be released early uh, based on you know, maybe something that isn't necessarily in the guidelines. Um, but what this does for families, and I can speak for our family, is every single time that an appeal comes up, every single time that a motion comes up, my cousins and us and the whole family, we have to relive that trauma. 
every year. It's been 40 years since I was six years old. I grew up with this. And he'll do anything to try and get out. He'll do anything to make, continue to make the lives of my cousins and my extended families, um, you know, very, very difficult. Uh, to relive that trauma, to relive it on an almost yearly basis is something that no family should have to go through. And especially a family, obviously, that has dealt with this type of trauma. Um, one of my cousins, I think, described it as generational trauma. So this isn't just trauma that, you know, unfortunately my, my cousins and uh, sisters of Joanne experience, but now their children. And now there's another generation that's dealing with it as well, being told about the story, being told about what happened, being told about the person who tries to get out of jail. So it's now multi-generational, the trauma. And it's just something, and I, again, applaud, and I'm, I'm proud to stand with the other families that are here today as well, um, to do what we can to fight to make sure that this um, legislation passes and that this loophole is overturned. Um, make sure that life without the eligibility of parole means life without the eligibility of parole. Thank you. Thanks. Now invite uh, Maureen Regan, daughter of John Regan, to speak to her family's experience. First of all, thank you very much, Mr. Patron, and Maureen, for inviting all of our families here today and for inviting me to um, speak to you about how medical parole specifically has absolutely blindsided and traumatized my family. The impending release of my father's murderer has demolished any sense of peace or justice my family's been able to carve out after the brutal murder of my father in 1995. As Attorney Glooney, um, District Attorney Glooney, told us, in 1997, John Stowe was convicted of murder in the first degree with no eligibility parole. Even so, that monster has tortured us countless times in appeals and court appearances and invented reasons why he shouldn't have to remain behind bars. Each and every time my family has written letters, shown up in person, and begged whoever we could to please not be duped by this con artist. We've had to relive and retell our story our horrible story, the disgusting story of how my father was brutally stabbed to death, how his body was weighed down in the Connecticut River, how the bloody towels used to clean up the crime scene were disposed of at a rest stop on his way to attend a wedding on Cape Cod. We have endured and persisted because we believed all our heartache, suffering, and tears would be rewarded with justice. In fact, the law was on our side until this law was not. This insane, poorly written law with a giant loophole is allowing this disgusting monster and many others just like him to escape from their prison sentences. He's not even terminally ill. He has a bad back and limited mobility. He's overweight, he's pre-diabetic. He needs supplemental oxygen because of a bout he had with COVID. But don't worry, he's recovered. Even the doctors reported that he isn't expected to die from any of those ailments. He's just permanently incapacitated and not likely to pose a threat to society. Well, he does pose a threat to society, to me and to my family. He's unrepentant and he's not rehabilitated. He's being released to a skilled nursing facility where he could be the new roommate of any of our elderly or ailing friends or relatives. I have been defined as a victim of violent crime for 27 years years. I am now being further victimized by the very system that was put into place to protect me. This is the definition of a travesty of justice for all of our families. It's a broken bill and it needs to be fixed. Thank you. What you can just see, and what I, my staff, and my colleagues across the Commonwealth have experienced in our work with families of murder victims, is that the pain and trauma of their sudden and tragic loss is constant and enduring. This loss and its accompanying grief 
become their own life sentence. It is our contention that this law has created an unintended loophole that has given inmates convicted of first degree murder who have been sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, a means to pursue that very possibility of parole, and in effect, to sidestep their lawful and due sentences and to circumvent the specific statutory punishment for this crime. Moreover, it causes undue, and I would argue unjust occasions for families of lost loved ones to have to relive their trauma. Lawful and just murder sentences must have finality after appropriate appeals. Accordingly, we encourage a review by our legislature and the governor to correct and amend this statute to maintain justice and decency for victims, families, and our communities. I certainly want to thank Jim and Maureen for speaking for their families. I want to thank everyone from the families here represented, from the Stoke family, Maureen, Regan Moriarty, Trisha Regan, from the Olszewski uh, case, uh, and the uh, Welch family, Paula Welch Mackey, Paula Welch Burns, Danny Burns, Jim Welch, and John Welch, and also in the case of um, the murder of Mr. Brodeur. Uh, they are also here as well, and I want to thank them for their presence and support. Brian Batista, Michelle Batista, Dominic Batista, Kyle Broder, Robert, and Robert Broder. Um, I thank them all for their courage and for enduring everything they've had to endure and for uh, shining a light on the issues that clearly exist with this statute and encouraging with me that this get corrected so their families and other families in similar situations don't have to unfairly continue uh, to deal with this injustice.